Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hi, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Ian Kai. He's a um, graduate student at MIT. Uh, Kostas Daskalakis is his advisor. He has some really great work on multidimensional mechanism design that's very seminal in, uh, at least in the algorithmic game theory community. And um, he's done some internships at Google with Aranyak Mehta and MSR Redmond and MSR Asia. Um, he's from Peking University originally. And uh, he'll talk to us today about mechanism design. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, it's great to be here today. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, today, I want to talk about mechanism design, uh, specifically on a new algorithmic framework. So uh, I want to divide my talk into four parts. Start, I want to give you an overview of the field of mechanism design. Then I want to uh, focus on my own work on how to optimize revenue in a multi-dimensional setting. Then I want to talk about some of my related work in algorithmic pricing. Uh, and then in the end, I want to briefly overview some of my other work. So uh, let me start with giving you an overview of the field of mechanism design. I want to show you what is uh, mechanism design and what is an auction. So uh, what is mechanism design? Uh, so uh, this is probably an old story. Uh, everyone knows it. So a mom wants to divide a cake up evenly among her two kids, but she does not know who likes what. So what usually happens is like both of the kids think the other guy gets a better slice. One might think the other one has more chocolate on it. The other thinks, oh, well, mine doesn't have a strawberry on it. Okay, so. Probably after a while, every mom learns the following solution to this problem. She'll let just one kid cut the cake and let the other pick. Okay? So in this case, both the kids will be happy, and she does not need to know who likes what. Okay? So this is just a very simple application of uh, mechanism design. So I want to think of mechanism design as the engineering part of uh, game theory or economics. So it's actually quite different from most part of game theory economics, where they usually start with an existing game or some economic system. Then they try to analyze the game, like what would happen if people are actually playing the game. They try to predict the outcome, or they take the outcome and try to explain why this happened. Okay? Well, mechanism design is the complete opposite. So usually you start with some uh, desired goal, then you want to design some game that if people are playing it, you can actually see the desired outcome arise from it. Okay? So it sounds quite similar to algorithm design, but the main difference or the difficulty here is the designer is usually ignoring. It's ignoring of uh, the player's uh, private information. For example, in the cake cutting example, the mother does not know who likes what. So if even in this complicated environment, the goals are achievable, how? Okay, that's uh, mechanism design. You probably also uh, heard about auctions when people are talking about mechanism design. I want to think of auctions as uh, any mechanism where you're allowed to use money. Okay, it's a very large part of mechanism design. There are also other scenarios where using money is undesirable. For example, you want to do election or fair division. Okay, but for this talk, I want to focus on just auction. I want to use the word auction and mechanism interchangeably. So turns out auction is also playing a very important role in our lives. So, so in many countries, uh, the governments actually use auctions to allocate uh, spectrums. They sell licenses using auctions uh, for, uh, for transmitting signals uh, in the electromagnetic uh, spectrum. So it turns out using auction actually helps the government to allocate the bands to the companies who value them the most and also creates a lot of revenue for the government. Uh, also, uh, auction is uh, very common in daily lives. Probably everyone has used one of these websites. So you can buy anything or sell anything on eBay, and there are these traveling websites. You can bid on your hotels and flight tickets. Okay. Yep. Suppose I'm a 
if I'm Best Buy and I'm trying to figure out how to price the uh, gadgets in my store? Is that mechanism design? Yes. It is. Okay. It is. I actually talk about something about this pricing. Okay. So uh, another example, this is probably one you will see in any talk about auction. So it's called Swanson Search, uh, also the ad auction. Uh, so what happened here is the advertisers want to display some ads to the users who are using Bin or Google. So what Bin or Google usually do is they run an auction among these advertisers, <coughs> then uh, they decide whose ads will be displayed and in what position. Okay. So hopefully I've convinced you uh, auction is very important. So from now on I want to formally analyze uh, auctions. So let me start with the definition. So you have one auctioneer. Uh, you have bidders, I'll label them 1 through M. You have items, I'll label them 1 through N. Okay? So bidders, they have a valuation on items or subsets of items. Uh, these, are, these valuations are uh, private information. So only the bidder himself knows it, not the other bidder, not the auctioneer. And this information is usually uh, encoded as bidder's type. So through the talk, I'll use little ti to denote bidder i's type and capital TI to be the set of possible types for bidder I. Okay, uh, so I also want to make two standard assumptions on this information. The first is uh, bidder I's type is sampled from some known distribution independently. Uh, by known, I mean uh, it's known to every bidder uh, as well as the auctioneer. I also want to assume bidder's valuation is additive, meaning for a set of items, your value for this set is simply the sum of the value for each item in it, okay? So from now on, I can just assume like bidder i's type is an n-dimensional vector where vij is his value for the j's item, okay? That's for the bidders. Uh, how about the auctioneer? So the auctioneer needs to decide how to allocate the items to the bidders. But uh, there are potentially some constraints on what allocations are actually allowed. So I'll soon give you examples on what these constraints might look like. Uh, but for now, just think of it as a general set system, okay? And I'll use F to denote the set system. So that's a setup. Uh, how do you actually run an auction? So the auctioneer first needs to design the auction. He needs to specify an allocation rule and pricing rule. Just think of them as two functions that map the big vector into an allocation and prices for everyone. Okay, once you have specified the auction, you commit to it, you cannot change it anymore, then you announce it. So the bidders will bid and you collect the bids, then apply the two functions to the bids. Then you will get an allocation and uh, prices for everyone. So that's for the auctioneer. Uh, for bidder, she would take her own type, the description of the auction, and uh, the distribution of our other bidder's type. And she would try to uh, optimize her own utility, which is the expected value minus ex expected price, uh, by playing around her bids, okay? This is strategic setting, so it's not necessarily true that she will bid her true value. If she thinks it's better, she might bid half of her value or square root of her value, okay? So for the auctioneer, his goal will be, first, he wants to guarantee the auction is designed in a way that uh, the bidders will actually bid truthfully. So this is with a loss of generality. And then the auctioneer might have some goal in his mind he wants to optimize. Sometimes it might be welfare, that's just the sum of every bidder's value. You can think of it as the happiness of the whole society. Or it might be his own happiness, which is the revenue. Okay. So uh, let me give you some example on the, the constraints on the allocations. The first one is very simple. So imagine I'm selling paintings. So one thing I definitely don't want to do is give one, uh, one painting to more than one bidder. Okay, and so in this example, uh, the feasible allocations are those you don't give any item more, out more than once. Okay, so this is a relatively simple case. I can have a slightly more complicated constraint. So imagine I'm selling houses. So again, I don't want to give one house to more than one bidder, but I also don't want some bidder wind up having more than one house in the end. Okay, so in this case, only matchings are allowed. Or I might have this crazy idea of selling doctor appointments using auctions. <laughs> okay, uh, so items are slots with doctors in the hospital. 
So I don't want to give one slot to more than one bidder. But I might also want, like, I don't want any bidder to see the same doctor more than once or give him overlapping slots. Okay? So you can think of this as a 3D matching uh, constraint. Okay? So uh, I've shown you what the constraints might look like. I uh, also want to give you some backgrounds on how to optimize welfare or revenue in auction. Okay? So I'll start with welfare. So turns out we understand uh, how to optimize welfare really well. Uh, Vickery, Clark, and Grove, they show the so-called VCG auction uh, optimizes welfare in any setting. So I want to think of their result as a reduction that reduces a mechanism design problem to an algorithm design problem. And that's the perspective I want to take for this talk. Okay? They reduce the mechanism design problem that's finding an auction that maximizes welfare to an algorithm design problem that, that's just finding uh, an allocation that maximizes welfare. So more specifically, the algorithm design problem is you find an allocation F that maximizes sum of everyone's value. Okay? So they show if this underlying algorithm design problem is uh, tractable for feasibly constrained F, so it's running the auction. Okay? And recently, uh, a sequence work uh, have sh uh, shown that this reduction can accommodate uh, approximation. So for welfare, I really understand the problem, uh, understand problem really well. Uh, so how about revenue? So for revenue, we understand much less. The most famous result is uh, due to Meyerson. He showed that if you have a single item for sale, then a simple auction can actually maximize its revenue. This is a beautiful result, and Meyerson actually won the Nobel Prize for it. So let's look at uh, what Myerson's auction actually looks like. Okay, so you have n bidders. Uh, the bidders will bid. Then the auctioneer take the bidders' bid, then uh, transform them into virtual bids. So the transformation here is a deterministic function, and depends on uh, bidders' distribution. Then the auctioneer just finds the bidder who has the highest virtual bid, not real bid, just the virtual bid, and allocate the item to him. Okay. So this is equivalent as finding an allocation that maximizes virtual welfare. Okay. Uh, so that's Myerson's auction. Uh, so arguably, eBay is running some special case of Myerson's auction every day. Okay. Uh, again, I want to think of Myerson's result as a reduction that reduces uh, a mechanism design problem, a problem you have truthfulness incentives to, and then just a purely algorithm design problem. So Myerson reduced the problem of finding a revenue optimal auction to uh, just computing a welfare optimal allocation. So let me remind you what just happened in Myerson's auction. So bidders report the types. These types are transformed into virtual types by the auctioneer. Then the auctioneer finds the allocation that maximizes the virtual welfare. Okay. And uh, the transformation is deterministic and depending, uh, and Myerson actually give an explicit formula for it for people who know it's a virtual value function. So if there's a single item for sale, we know how to optimize revenue. But a natural question to ask, okay, for welfare, we, under, we know how to solve for arbitrary settings. For here, you only know how to do for a single item. How about, like, I want to sell many items together. So for the second part of my talk, I want to focus on this problem. So no surprise, this problem actually becomes one of the central problem in mathematical economics. So it's called a multidimensional mechanism design problem. So the problem states the following. If you have many items and you have many bidders, can you still have efficiently computable and revenue optimal auction? And hopefully the auction will be something simple. If you have very complicated auction, like the, the bidders might not understand what to do in this auction, so they might not participate at all. Okay? Is there some trivial complicated auction? I don't know, it can be a very long laundry list. Say, if the profile is this, I do that. Like, if the profile is that, I do that. Like, it can be output by some program. So, if you just see this long list, uh, the, uh, the bidders won't believe you. Like, being truthful is the best thing, maybe. Or they don't know how to act. Just something like this. Does that exist? You can come up with something like that, but. Uh, so, there is some trivial. Like, yeah, there's uh, some trivial thing where you think you can do that. Be like, what, exponentially yeah. long? Yeah, exponential, exponential long description of the auction. Okay. 
So from now on, I want to use the acronym for this problem, MDMDP. So the setting is called multidimensional. It's for uh, this following simple reason. So if you have many items to specify a bitter's type, you need uh, many numbers. While when you have one item, one number is enough. Okay. So let me take one step back and try to understand why this problem is not trivial. Okay. I've told you Myerson's auction optimized revenue when there's a single item. Okay. One natural thing you might want to try is, okay, why not just run Myerson's auction on the items independently? Okay. So it turns out this is uh, not a very good idea. So the first problem with this approach was like, okay, this might violate feasibility constraint. If you're selling houses, if I run this auction, it's likely someone will end up with more than one house. Okay. So, but even in some very simple setting while running this auction gives you a feasible allocation, the revenue it collects can actually be far away from the optimal. Okay, I want to show you a very simple example. So the example is really simple. You have one bidder, you have n items. The bidder's valuation for the, the items is just draw an ID from uniform zero one distribution. Okay. So if you want to run Myerson's auction on every item independently, what you would do is set price one half on every item. Okay. Then with probably one half, the bidder will buy that item. Right? So you collect revenue one quarter from every item. So in expectation, what you get is n over four. So let me propose another auction. Okay, so I make the following, uh, take your leave choice to uh, the bidder. So I say, I give you this grand bundle if you're willing to pay me one minus epsilon times n over two. Think of epsilon as a tiny, tiny constant. Okay. Sorry. So notice that the bidder's expected value for this grand bundle is n over two. And it's easy to see with probably almost one, his value is higher than the price I give him. So basically, I'm guaranteed to sell this uh, item with probably, the, the grand bundle was probably one, so revenue is roughly n over two. Okay? So shows Myerson's auction on every item independently is at least factor two away from the optimal. And in fact, this gap can be much larger. When the items are independent, this gap can actually be as bad as log n. And if the items are correlated, this gap can actually be unbounded. So hopefully I've convinced you this problem is non-trivial. I also want to uh, give you some uh, overview of previous results. So from the economic side, uh, a large body of work has been devoted to this problem. But uh, progress has been sporadic. From the computer science side, constant factor approximations are known for some settings. Uh, for all, some of the special settings, even exact solutions are known. But all these settings are quite limited, and the techniques are ad hoc. In fact, all these results only apply to special cases of the MDMDP problem. Okay? So I've shown you a long list of papers. The real message I want to convey is actually uh, <laughs> this. Okay. So uh, let me uh, use the examples I described earlier to show what these previous results can actually do. Okay? So an example of selling paintings. So we understand the problem pretty well. We know how to solve it optimally. Uh, in the example of selling houses, we don't know how to solve it optimally, but many constant factor approximations are known. Okay? But if you want to sell doctor appointments, we don't know how to solve it optimally. We don't know how to give any reasonable approximation. And not even mentioning if the feasibility constraint is just something general, we know absolutely nothing. Okay? So what I'm going to do next, I want to uh, give you a general framework which can solve all these problems all together. Okay. So our result states that uh, we can generalize Myerson's theorem to solve the MDMDP problem for arbitrary feasibility constraint f. Okay. So our result has two aspects. First, I want to compute the optimal auction. So what we show is we can reduce this mechanism design problem to an algorithm design problem again. Okay? We can reduce the problem of finding the revenue optimal auction to an uh, algorithm design problem that's just finding the welfare optimal allocation. It's the same problem like what VCG uses and Myerson uses. Okay? So once you have found the optimal auction, as I said, the auction can, be still, can still be something very complicated. It might just give you a long laundry list on what to do on every type profile. 
But what we show is the allocation rule of this auction is something quite simple. The allocation rule itself can actually be reduced to uh, a welfare, uh, the, the same algorithm design problem that's just finding the optimal welfare, uh, op uh, welfare optimal allocation. So what it looks like is the following. So bidders will submit their types. Uh, the auctioneer takes the types and transforms them into virtue types, then finds the allocation that maximizes virtual welfare. So this is very similar to Myerson's result. The only difference is in Myerson's result, the transformation is some deterministic function and uh, given by explicit formula. In our case, the transformation is randomized and it's computed by an LP. And it's known that randomness is necessary. If you want to solve MDMDP, uh, there are examples showing randomized, algorithms, randomized mechanisms is strictly better than deterministic ones. So you, you do need randomness. Okay, so uh, uh, for our result to work, what we really need is just a black box access to some algorithm A that uh, finds an optimal uh, welfare optimal allocation for feasibility constraint F. Okay, if I have this black box access to this algorithm A, I can solve the problem. <coughs> okay, so that means I don't even need to know what F is. Okay, as long as I have A, I'm done. Okay, so one question you might ask is. Well, good. If you can solve this algorithm design problem exactly, you can design the optimal, uh, optimal auction. But sometimes just solving this uh, algorithm design problem might be impossible. It's MP hard. So can you say anything in this case? So what happened? Oh. So what we show is uh, if you have any approximation algorithm to this algorithm design problem, so our reduction still works and preserves the approximation factor. Okay. So the main technical barrier from extending the exact solution to uh, this approximate solution is that here we need to optimize some objective uh, over a possibly not convex or not even connected region. Okay. So by understanding the nuts and bolts of the ellipsoid algorithm, we managed to do that. Okay. So again, uh, you don't need to know. Uh, so what you really need to uh, have is black box access to this approximation algorithm for feasibility constraint. Is it really the same alpha? Uh, it's really the same alpha. Okay, alpha minus epsilon for arbitrary small epsilon you want. Okay. And again, you don't need to know what f is. Only black box access to this algorithm. So let me actually give the proof. So in a very high level sense, what I want to do is want to use an LP to find the optimal auction. Okay. So I want my variables to describe an auction. So I need the variables to be allocation probabilities and prices. Okay. Then I want to make sure my auction is a truthful auction. So I want to write a truthful, uh, truthfulness con uh, constraint. That's just, if you're reporting your true type, you're maximizing your utility, okay? And I also want to guarantee my auction is feasible, meaning for every type profile, the auction will choose an allocation that is in F, okay? And the objective is uh, the expected revenue. So uh, let me just propose something really obvious. So I want to describe the auction in this following way. So for every type profile, I give you a distribution over feasible allocations, okay? And I say, if the reported profile is this, I'll sample one allocation from the distribution I gave you, okay? That's the description of the auction. So in this case, truthfulness is very easy to uh, check. You can compute a bidder's utility based on his true type and what he reports, okay? And feasibility is also trivial to track. You just, you just look at every type profile and see if the distribution is really a distribution. Okay, that's it. So the only issue with this approach is, okay, the number of variables is simply too large. It's, it depends on F, and it's also uh, uh, depends on the total number of type profiles, which is exponential in our input. 
Okay, so I cannot use this and hope to solve the LP efficiently. So let me propose something slightly more complicated. Okay, so now for every type profile, I don't give you a whole distribution. Okay, I only give you some marginal probabilities. For every bitter i, I tell you the marginal probability you will get item j under this type profile. Okay, that's it. Uh, so again, truthfulness is still easy to check. Using this, you can still compute bitter's utility. For now, feasibility actually becomes a problem. Okay, you need, I only give you the marginals. You need to see whether under the type profile there is really a distribution that matches all the marginals. Okay, it's unclear how you can solve this. But also, the number of variables is large, is better than the previous one. It does not depend on the size of f, but it's still exponential in the input. So none of this two uh, is going to help because like number of variables too large. If I want to solve the LP efficiently, there's just no way I can do it. Okay. What I really want is something here. I really want a succinct description of the auction where I have a small number of variables that can hope to uh, solve the LP. And it's probably too optimistic to hope something here might work, okay? Because you have succinct description, you already compress a lot of information about the auction, then checking feasibility could actually be very hard. So, uh, so probably something here is what we're looking for. Uh, let me actually propose something that light, lies there. So what I want to use is this called entering allocation rule or uh, reduce form. So what I want you to think of it as promises the auctioneer make to the bidders. So I promise you, if you're a bidder I and your type is TI, I give item J to you with probably this much in expectation over every bidder's type and the randomness of the auction. Okay, that's the promise I want to make. I also make similar promises about the prices I want to charge you. If your type is I, uh, sorry, if you're a bidder I, your type is TI, uh, I'll charge you this much, again, in expectation of every bidder's type and the randomness of the auction, okay? So, turns out, if you use reduce form, it's actually something here. So first, the number of variables is much smaller. This polynomial in uh, the total number of bidder types, not type profile, which is polynomial in our input, which is very good. So. Although this is a very succinct description, I can still compute uh, bidder's utility based on uh, what you report and what your true type is, okay? And truthfulness is okay. Well, the only issue is feasibility, okay? If you think about it, basically you take the probabilities that are given to you in the second case, then you marginalize it over other bidder's type, you will get a reduced form, okay? So basically, you start with a distribution under every type profile you marginalize over items, then you go from one to two, then you marginalize over other bidders type, you go two to three, you get a reduced form. So to check visibility, you need to understand what, whether you can basically demarginalize your reduced form to get a distribution under every type profile, okay? So it's really unclear how you can solve it. So in fact, even when there's only a single item, checking visibility is quite hard. Recently, there are two papers essentially just trying to solve uh, this problem, checking feasibility for a single item, okay? But like, we still want to solve it. I want to show you uh, how to solve it uh, soon. So this is the LP I really want to use, okay? To find the opt uh, revenue optimal auction. So the variables are the reduced form, okay? So I have truthfulness, so it's probably hard to see, but I can use uh, the reduced form to write a linear constraint for that, okay? Uh, so uh, the only thing it's unclear is feasibility constraint, okay? And a wishful thinking is maybe I can design some separation oracle that checks feasibility efficiently. If I can have a separation oracle for feasibility, I can just solve this LP and find the revenue optimal auction. Okay, and that's it. Okay, so uh, let me show you how to check feasibility. So I want to start with how to check feasibility for a single item. Okay. So for starter, I want to give you this really, really simple example. So you have one item, you have two bidders. 
Uh, the bidder's distribu uh, distribution is uniform in their type set. Bidder 1 has type A and B. Bidder 2 has type C and B. Okay? So question, is the following feasible, or, uh, is the uh, following reduced form feasible? So for bidder 1, I make the following promises. If your type is A, I guarantee you get the item always. If your type is B, you get the item with probably 0.2, okay, et cetera. So any guess whether this reduced form is feasible? Okay, let's see. So I want to start with A, right? Uh, I know if A shows up, I need to give the item to him always, right? So if the profile is AC or profile is AD, I need to give the item to A always. So in this case, A is satiated. So now let me look at profile B and C. So I claim that C should get it always in this case. Why? Because C needs to get it with probably 0.5, and he shows up with A with probably 0.5, right? In that case, he's never getting it. A always get it. So C has to get the item for, uh, uh, for all the rest of the time. So when B, C shows up, C needs to get the item always. Now type C is satiated. So the only profile I haven't considered is B and D, okay? So it turns out B needs to get an item with probably 0.4, and D needs to get it with probably 0.8. And there's no way I can satisfy them both, okay? So this reduced form is infeasible, but this is really, really simple case. Uh, I'm so lucky that having pi A as one, which gives me a very natural start, right? Uh, and also, the setting is simple. I have two bidders. I have uniform distribution, or if I, well, if I have many bidders and complicated distribution, uh, it's not even clear whether there's a systematic way to check feasibility, not even mentioning checking uh, efficiently. Okay. So what I want to do next is show you a very natural, necessary condition for uh, checking the feasibility. Okay. So for every bidder, now just pick a subset of your types, okay, call it SI. Okay. I claim for any choices of the subsets, the following uh, inequality you should hold, okay? So the left-hand side is the probability there is some bidder i whose type is in SI, and he gets the item, okay? That's the left-hand side. The right-hand side is just the probability there is some bidder i whose type is in SI. I don't care where the item goes, just your type is in SI, okay? So clearly, uh, the left-hand side should be smaller than the right-hand side. It doesn't matter, like, the choices of the subsets, okay? It's a very natural, necessary condition. But the surprising thing is, turns out this thing is also sufficient. So if this inequality holds for any choices of the subsets, uh, the reduced form is feasible, okay? So if you encode this problem as a never flow problem using some type of max flow mean cut theorem, you can uh, show this uh, result. Okay. So that means uh, if you have complicated distribution or many bidders, there is still at least a systematic way to check visibility. Okay. But if you want to enumerate all the possible choices for subsets to check visibility, it's exponential time, right? So uh, you need to enumerate like a large set of uh, possible conditions. So after a lot of sweat, uh, with Matt and Costas, we actually show we can check visibly efficiently in time almost linear in just the sum of bitter types, not type profiles, okay? So that's what I want to show you for a single item feasibility. So, but what we really want to do is check visibility for many items, right? So. One thing I want to emphasize is that uh, this is not just a harder problem of this, uh, harder version of the same problem. It's actually quite different problem. So you have many items. So the never flow formulation somehow doesn't make much sense. You probably want to do like multi commodity flow, which gets way messier. And also I have this complicated feasibility constraint F, arbitrary complicated. Okay. So how can we check visibility for uh, many items? Okay. So we tried to uh, extend the combinatorial approach we use for a single item to this case, but it doesn't quite work, and it's unlikely will work. What we really use is a geometric approach. So you want to. So what we what we do is we think of the reduced forms as actually a high-dimensional vector. 
reduced form is just a function map the types to uh, probabilities, okay? You can think of it as a high dimensional vector. So let me call uh, the set of feasible reduced form uh, FFD. This is just a high dimensional uh, object. The first claim I want to make is FFD is actually a convex polytope, okay? The proof is uh, quite easy. Uh, I don't want to uh, waste my time here. If you want to hear the details, I can uh, tell you offline. So uh, now I know the feasible region is a convex polytope, and you want to get a separation oracle for a convex polytope. There is a classical way of doing it using, uh, by using uh, this famous result, the equivalence of separation optimization by Grotcho, Lovas, and Schreiber. Okay. What the result states is if you have a polytope and you can optimize on any direction, that you, there is a generic way you can turn this optimization algorithm into a separation oracle. Okay. So if you want to use this approach, the real question you want to ask is, can we actually optimize on our polytope okay, in any direction? Well, the answer is like almost. So we show this interesting characterization. Basically, it states that if you have direction, you want to optimize on direction W, there's some way I can reinterpret this direction as virtual values for the bidders. Okay? Then if you use uh, an allocation rule that always maximizes the virtual welfare, the corresponding reduced form will be the furthest corner uh, on direction W. Okay? So the real problem is now is like, can you compute these corners? If you can, by just using GL as a result, you get a separation oracle. Okay? What did you assume again about the form in which you're given the feasibility constraints? Or do you only have, a, you're only given a black box that yeah, yeah. can optimize welfare for given? Yes, so I, I, I'm only assuming I have a black box access to this algorithm that computes uh, optimized for F. Okay. I don't, I'm not seeing F. Okay. So are we done here? Uh, well, not really. So it turns out if you want to actually uh, compute these corners efficiently, you need to do some sampling. But this will give you some additive error, epsilon. And to get uh, error epsilon, you actually need to spend time polynomial in one over epsilon. But unfortunately, for GLS result to work, they actually require the epsilon to be exponentially small. Otherwise, the result's not giving you anything meaningful, OK? So using GLS result, I can get a separation oracle, but which has running time exponential, which is not useful. So what we really need is some GLS type of result, but it has to be robust to additive error. So by using some novel techniques, we managed to do that. Uh, what we show is some analog of the GLS result. I want you to think of it as the mechanism design version of the equivalence optimization and separation. So the result says the following. So if you're given an algorithm that maximizes welfare for a feasibly constrained F, then there's a generic way I can turn this algorithm into a separation oracle for FFT, okay? And an approximate separation oracle. Okay. So using this result, I can actually get a separation oracle for, uh, for, uh, for checking the feasibility. So I can use it to solve the LP, and then the end result I will get is F Pyrrhus for the MDMDP problem, okay? So uh, that completes our proof. So, uh, so auction is a very general, general thing, but in real life, we actually see more simpler form of uh, selling items, okay? Probably like pricing is one of the most common one. So I want to share some uh, my result in a pricing problem. So consider this a very uh, fundamental pricing problem. You have one seller, he wants to get a cell phone for himself, okay? It's clear that what he wants is, what he will buy is the one that maximizes surplus, the value minus the price. Okay. So the seller knows the buyer's values are drawn independently from some known distribution d1 to dn. So what the seller wants to do is actually come up with a set of prices that will maximize his revenue. Okay. So I want to make this uh, uh, technical assumption that the di is a monotone hazard rate distribution. So that is the definition. But what I really want to tell you is MHR is very commonly used in economics and contains Gaussian exponential uniform distribution. So it's kind of broad class. 
So uh, for this problem, before our result, only constant factor approximations are known. So you think that there is only a single buyer? Sorry, single prior? No, I have many prior. Single, single buyer, yes, only a single buyer. Only a single buyer. Only a single buyer, yes. So if you assume the buyer's IID, it's the same. So if there are non-IID buyers, it's different. Okay. So uh, we showed there are actually uh, a p-test for this problem. And this is uh, probably the first p-test for a uh, multi-dimensional setting. Before that, all, everything is just constant approximation. So I want to share uh, an interesting probability theorem we show in this work. So we show that if there are n independent MHR random variables, okay, they're not necessarily the same. Then there exists an anchoring point such that first, the probability of the max uh, being above this uh, uh, anchoring point is an absolute constant. Well, that's not surprising. Such a point always exists. The surprising part is if you shoot out for a constant factor, 1 over epsilon times log of 1 over epsilon, the contribution from these high values to the expectation is actually tiny. Okay? So I want to compare it with Markov's uh, inequality, which has some somewhat similar flavor. So Markov's inequality says if you shoot off a constant factor of your expectation, <coughs> The probability of seeing something uh, above the threshold is tiny, but does not say anything about the contribution to expectation. Only says the probability, okay? In my, it might be the case the contribution to expectation is actually very large, okay? But here, we're not only saying the probability of this high value is uh, small, we're also saying the contribution is tiny, okay? So another thing I want to mention is there is actually a whole area called uh, extreme value theory. They study uh, the max or mean behavior of a bunch of random variables, but usually what they study is uh, IID distributions. Okay, here we can deal with uh, non-IID distributions. Okay, so uh, turns out this uh, result has many applications. So you can actually get a constant factor approximation to this pricing problem uh, immediately. Yes. So can you go back to the previous? Thing? Okay. So the bound on the prob so so in the middle at the bottom. That bound uh, is not related to beta, it's just... Uh, epsilon beta. No, no. So omega of 1, right? Oh, yes, that's an absolute constant. It's uh, an So that constant doesn't show up in your bound on the right? No. And beta shows... So it, if I rescale the distribution, it should somehow not affect... Uh, yes, but like you also rescale beta, right? So this thing also changes. But if I rescale, it should not change is my intuition. Um, if I just rescale the x-axis, yes. the bound on a probability should not, or, oh, it's an expectation. Expected. Yeah. Expectation, not the probability, yeah. yeah. Uh, yep. is, is, there some, uh, is there some intuition even in the IID case why this should... Uh... So in the IID case, is actually if your MHR distribution, yeah. your max is also MHR. So MHR, you know, it's very like concentrated, so you can get this kind of thing. But yeah. If, if it isn't independent, then you might not end up. With yeah, you might not. It is independent, but the max of non-ID MHR is not MHR, so you cannot just use this thing. But that's probably giving you some intuition why this. And MHR is the ones like your your tail is not uh, heavier than exponential, so. Okay. So okay, I want to talk about some applications of this result. So one thing you can do is you basically price everything at beta. So you know with constant probability you will sell the item. And you know that you cannot get better than beta much, right? Like high values, they're only epsilon beta. So, so this gives you a constant factor of the pricing problem immediately. Okay? If you want to use, if, if you're going to use this uh, theorem more carefully, you can actually design a p-test for this problem. And recently we found an application of this theorem for uh, uh, some multi-bidder setting. So the uh, constant factor approximation is just to sell everything at the same price beta. Yes, it's a very simple uh, auction. So, I mean, the constant might not be very well, but good, but uh, it's constant. So uh, for auction setting, we found out how to use this to improve the runtime by an exponential factor for certain setting. Okay. So uh, let me also talk about some of my other work. The first one to show you is this uh, min-max theorem. Like we generalize min-max theorem to multiplayer games. 
So in mechanism design, so you can design a game, where sometimes the game is just given to you. For example, in poker or rock, paper, scissors. In this case, you still want to understand what will happen, right? So, so poker and rock, paper, scissors is just a special case of the two-player zero-sum game. And we know in two-player zero-sum game, if people are playing min-max strategy, that forms uh, equilibrium. And you can actually compute these uh, strategies using a linear program, right? So, Oh, min max strategy is the one that minimizes or maximum loss. Okay. So that somehow shows two player zero sum game is very nice class, right? You know, understands what really happened in the end. And in fact, Robert Allman, a very famous game theorist, uh, another Nobel laureate, he actually said that probably two player zero sum game is the only case you can make sharp and unique prediction on uh, the player's behavior. And some recent TCS result actually provided support for this uh, claim. So we know if we have two-player game, but the whole game is non-zero-sum, it's PBAD complete to find a natural equilibrium. Or you, if you throw in one more player. If there's three player, even the game is zero-sum, it's still PBAD complete, okay? So is there any hope you can generalize this uh, min-max theorem to many uh, multiplayer game, okay? So, if you want to generalize, first thing you want to rule out is uh, three-way interaction. If you have three-way interaction, if the game's uh, zero-sum, it's going to be PPAD complete. So we want to just focus on uh, pairwise interaction. So uh, there is a broad class of game called polymatrix game. So players are nodes on a graph. Okay? Uh, every edge is just a game between the two endpoints. So now you only have pairwise interaction. Uh, a player's payoff is just a sum of the payoffs from all adjacent edges. Okay? So, for example, play, uh, for player U, his uh, payoff is this. Okay? It's called polymatrix because every player has many payoff matrix. Instead of, uh, in the other case, you only have one. Okay? Player U can only choose one action, right? No, no, no. You, you use one strategy and play against all your uh, neighbors. Same strategy in all the games. Yes, one strategy in all the games. But unfortunately, just for this simple game, it's PPAD complete to find a uh, natural equilibrium. Like basically, you can see a two-player game, if you put no zero, no zero sum game here, like it's PPAD complete, right? But I want to throw in this one extra uh, condition. I want to assume the whole game, the global game, the whole game is zero sum. The sum of every player's payoff always sum up to zero, okay? That's the assumption I want to make. So. This is a game actually first studied by Bragman and Falkings in the 70s. They gave an uh, algorithm for finding a natural equilibrium, but it's not necessarily a polynomial time one. So what we show is uh, for this game, we can actually compute a natural equilibrium efficiently in polynomial time. And the set of natural equilibrium is convex. And interestingly, if you run no regret learning algorithms on the nodes, the, empiric, uh, the empirical behavior will actually converge to a natural equilibrium uh, efficiently. Okay? So that basically inherits all nice properties of two player zero sum game. Okay? And arguably, this is the broadest class you can hope for positive results. If you are throw away this pairwise interaction assumption, you run into PPAD completeness. If you throw away the zero sum, you also run into PPAD completeness. Okay? So, uh, the last work I want to talk about is uh, something I do, uh, uh, I do in online matching. Uh, so in the beginning, I show you this ad auction example. Uh, mechanism design is trying to understand the economic parts of this problem. There's another branch of research trying to understand the online nature of this problem. It's called online matching. So uh, in online matching, the model is, is the following. You have a bipartite graph. Uh, you have offline side U and you have uh, online side V. The online side nodes uh, arrive one by one, and once the node arrives, the incident edges are revealed. And once the node arrives, you need to make a decision whether you want to match it to someone or just want to let it go. Okay? And all decisions are irrevocable. Okay? That's just a model. So online matching is usually used in ad allocations. Okay? Uh, but usually, uh, so in, there's a difference between theory and practice. In theory, Online matching usually just try to maximize the cardinality of the matching. So just one objective. 
But in practice, there are actually sometimes more than one objective. You want to optimize revenue, welfare, and ROI, many things. And sometimes these constraints, these objectives are conflicting. You want to somehow balance them. Okay. So uh, last summer, uh, during my internship at Google, uh, we come up with this uh, new model. So now every edge uh, has a color. So think of this case like orange edges are the ones gives you good revenue and green ones gives you good welfare, okay? And what you want to do is you want to find uh, matching that somehow balances two objectives. So the objective we want to do is we want to maximize the, the cardinality of the mean color matches, okay? I want to maximize, but I still want to balance, okay? So uh, uh, we show some interesting result, but one, one thing, uh, one property about this problem I want to share with you is that using a uh, greedy algorithm is actually quite a bad idea in this case. Uh, so we call this uh, skipping. So skip means if a node comes and there's available uh, nodes you can match to, you decide not to match, you just let it go. That's what we call skipping. So in the orig original problem, skipping is definitely bad, okay? So you should always match. But in this case, what we show is if you use determinic, uh, deterministic algorithm and you don't do skipping, so this gives you absolutely nothing, okay? If you're allowed to use randomized algorithm and you don't do skipping, it's still not very good. It's, uh, at most you can do one half. So if you want to beat one half, you need to do skipping in a clever way. And we managed to show a randomized algorithm that actually can beat this uh, point five, uh, one half barrier. And we come quite close to the possible optimal. So uh, let's wrap up. Uh, so first I show you uh, a reduction from the mechanism design problem that's maximizing revenue to an algorithm design problem that's just finding an allocation to maximize welfare, okay? So this is kind of general framework. So an interesting future direction is to see if there are other mechanism design problem you can also reduce to algorithm design problem. So uh, Brendan and Nicole has some work on showing hardness of doing this uh, reduction. Uh, and then I also talk about some of uh, my other work in algorithmic pricing. I show you this interesting extreme value theorem. I also show you how to generalize min-max theorem to work in multiplayer zero-sum games. In the end, uh, I talk about some of my result in online matching. And that's all. Thank you for your attention. Multiplayer theorem actually. So is, that, is there actually a min-max theorem there, or is it just a computability? So uh, we call it min-max theorem is because it also can be derived directly from the strong duality. That's kind of similar to the two-player uh, zero, uh, two zero-sum. So that's why we call it. But it's not necessarily you're playing a min-max strategy. Yeah. <laughs>